going to share my screen. And I'm going to begin my presentation. And Anne, could you shake your head uh, that do you see my presentation? Thank you. So uh, good day attendees. If you don't know me, I am Rob Lesher with the Pennsylvania Library Association. Thank you for attending the 2021 Pennsylvania Library Association Virtual Annual Conference. I hope you are enjoying the conference so far, and I know that you are going to have many opportunities to learn and connect over the next few days. Um, our presentation for this session is titled Welcoming Financial Literacy Programming Back to Your Libraries. Together, we can achieve success. In our presentation, um, I'm going to begin um, with a, a discussion about PA Forward, the literacies, the impact of COVID, and how we are going to uh, work and uh, giving you some ideas on how we're going to work on bringing programming back to our libraries in the coming year. And also um, give you some ideas about things to consider as we restart our in-person programming. Amy Saudi with, the, with FIA will discuss programming and resources available through their agency. And then our third presenter is Anne DiCecco from the Department of Treasury, and she will discuss financial literacy resources that are available to all libraries through their department. So at this point, I am going to begin my part of the presentation. So as I mentioned, uh, I'm Rob Lesher. I am the PA Forward Program Manager. Um, I have been uh, with the Pennsylvania Library Association as the PA Forward Program Manager uh, since September of 2019, when I replaced uh, Brandy uh, Hunter Davenport, who many of you I know uh, knew from uh, her years of working with the association and with PA Forward. Uh, but I have really been involved with PA Forward since about 2010 which was when PA Forward was being planned um, as, uh, as an actual program. Um, a little personal information about myself. Uh, personally, uh, I am a Gen Xer. And uh, I'll admit uh, being a Gen Xer has modeled my worldview. And so if suddenly I say something that sounds horribly sarcastic, uh, I just wanted to let you know that uh, about myself. Um, I have uh, worked in libraries for more than 30 years, and I have had experience uh, both in public and in academic libraries and uh, now with the Pennsylvania Library Association. PA Forward is an initiative of the Pennsylvania Library Association. PA Forward is a framework that was designed uh, and um, launched by a group of experts in our library field. It was designed between about uh, 2009 and 2011, and it was really set up to be a, a response to a number of budget cuts that were coming for libraries. And what the task force that was formed that designed PA Forward uh, was tasked with doing was to create a framework that could be used by libraries to communicate more succinctly the impact that they have on their communities. And what came out of that task force was the PA Forward initiative. Its tagline is literacy is power and libraries provide the fuel. It's based on the concept that there are five literacy areas that our residents have to be fluent in to be successful in a 21st century society. And those five literacy areas are basic information, civic and social, health, and financial, the topic of today's uh, program. Uh, as a PA4 program manager, I coordinate the two specific initiatives of the program, the STAR Library Program, and I also work with and develop relationships with our statewide partners, such as FIA, and the Department of Treasury, who will be speaking a little later. Uh, PA Forward is 
a project that is made possible in part by the Library Services and Technology Act funds from the U.S. Institute of Museum and Library Services as administered by the Pennsylvania Department of Education through the Office of Commonwealth Libraries and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Tom Wolf Governor. So today's presentation and what we've said today, we are going to focus more specifically on financial literacy as an aspect of PA Forward. So in our initiative, financial literacy is defined as the ability to make informed decision in, the, in areas ranging from personal finance, business management, teaching spending and saving skills to children and students, helping elders with retirement and estate planning, and also just really generally understanding how finances and money work in our Commonwealth. Um, we really do have some information and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of the materials that are available, but in terms of financial literacy, we do have a, a really great rationale sheet that can be found at the PA Libraries website. And really the rationale sheet gives a real, a high level 30,000 foot picture of why libraries do financial literacy programming. and why other departments like Department of Treasury or the uh, FIA are interested in training our residents in financial literacy. Uh, so that is pretty much uh, what I was going to talk about in terms of PA Forward. Um, but PA Forward and all libraries were really impacted in March of 2020. Uh, suddenly, we found that we could not do in-person programs or in-person meetings. I wasn't able to do any trainings uh, with you in, in your library at that point in time. Libraries were physically inaccessible to their users. Um, it's also very important to note um, and to communicate the fact that yes, your library building was closed to the public, but as a library, you were still providing services to your community. Admittedly, this process caused a lot of stress on you and also I know on your communities. And hopefully by the end of today's full presentation, you will um, be able to help find some ways to reduce your personal stress and uh, also your public stress as you begin to welcome people back into your buildings for in-person programming. Uh, COVID-19 truly has changed everything. Technology has become extremely more important. And honestly, it wasn't just libraries that were closed, but everything was closed. Uh, personally, um, early on in March of last, of last year, in March of 2020, um, I had a, a lovely weekend plan to go to New York City to see a couple of Broadway shows. Uh, and those shows were uh, instantly closed. Um, I also personally find that uh, my stress release is often singing with choral groups and all of the choral groups had to end, um, you know, and so um, it was quite a challenge um, for me personally in terms of trying to deal with that kind of social attitude. Um, probably the greatest outcome that we have truly seen about programming that came out from COVID is the impact and the new kind of heightened relationship between financial literacy and information literacy. Um, the lines between these have really become blurred. And by that I mean, and, and why I say that is because it has become even more um, obvious that 80% of internet users look for financial information online. That's fine. However, the proprietary ranking methods of our major search tools uh, do not tell you what those results are based upon. However, it is clear that sponsored results come up higher in a search um, result 
And that can lead to some misinformation and misleading information being shared to your public. Uh, and so therefore, how are we going to combat this problem of making sure that we are providing accurate financial literacy information in our program? Well, really programming was impacted in three very specific and important ways in, as, um, from this COVID shutdown. And as we look forward to reintroducing in-person programming into our libraries, we wanna take a look at kind of like three very important topics. One is virtual programs are programs. Um, subject matter experts are more important than ever and flexibility is key to, the, to our ability to have successful programming. So quite specifically, you guys did a great job of instantly pivoting to virtual programming and providing virtual programs in your, in your libraries. I just want you to know virtual programs are programs. The virtual programs you have been doing count towards your PA Forward STAR programs and the programs that you've worked with. Our partners have also pivoted to providing virtual programs. And these programs are gonna continue. There are going to be virtual programs. We're going to hopefully welcome people back, but we will also have a need to continue to provide quality virtual programming into the future. And as a part of that, it has become absolutely clear how important subject matter experts and subject matter expertise is to our provision of good library programming. Um, librarians are not subject matter experts in everything. Librarians are subject matter experts in the acquisition, organization, and access of information and knowledge. They are not experts in retirement planning, nor are they experts in financial savings. Uh, so therefore, finding subject matter experts like FIA, like the Department of Treasury, uh, like some of our other partners is critical as we move forward in presenting quality programs and quality information. And we need to be flexible as we know Things change, um, our capacity is changing from time to time and mask mandates versus non-mask mandates. We just need to be flexible and just plan for programming that we know we can pivot with as time goes on. You pivoted so well when the, world, when the library shut down, it is, so important for us to continue being, uh, continue to carry out that flexibility. Um, we do have some resources with the Pennsylvania Library Association and PA Forward that are available to you to kind of give you some ideas about the types of programming that's available. Some um, very specific, those tools are things like the PA Forward Commons, the PA Forward Digital Media Calendar, the PA Forward the Marketing Tools site, and of course the PA Forward Niche Academy. Uh, the PA Forward Commons is located on the PALA website. It's under Get Involved and the PA Forward Flyout. Commons has a whole array of programs that have been successfully carried out by libraries and they include not just in-person programs, but also virtual programs. The, um, P, the Pennsylvania Library Association PR and Marketing Committee puts together every year a digital media calendar based upon PA Forward and literacies. And in addition to having a full calendar that's uh, the breadth of an entire year's worth of programs that you can do, um, they actually take each month and dig deeper into the observance and to, that, to those days and provide you with sample programming ideas, sample newsletter ideas, sample ideas of 
uh, social media posts. And some of those social media posts also include the graphics that are involved. And here are just an example of a few of the financial literacy uh, digital media post recommendations uh, that were uh, um, in the calendar over the last couple of months. There are also uh, the PA Forward marketing tools, uh, things such as all of the publications, the overview, the rationale sheets, uh, the digital media calendar, the commons, our star library program. All of these things can be found uh, and all of these marketing tools are put together in one place uh, under the PA Forward website. And we also have available to you the Niche Academy. Currently, the Niche Academy is uh, where we are migrating to uh, where you can submit for your star library statuses and where you can maintain your star library statuses. But we are also on the Niche Academy growing a collection of virtual programs, a virtual programming library, programs that have been carried out by your fellow libraries and fellow librarians. And we're making those available in the um, Niche Academy, and you can use those in your library. You can uh, connect to that video via your Facebook page or via your uh, any of your social media. Uh, and um, we're going to continue to grow that virtual programming library over the years and invite libraries to submit programs on an ongoing basis that we can add to those. So as I talked about subject matter experts, um, the partnerships of PA Forward are really geared towards providing subject matter experts to be able to provide with you the resources and information about financial literacy that you can use in your library. Those partners are like FIA or the Department of Treasury and the programs that they have that are available for you to use. In addition to FIA and Treasury, we are also formal partners with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the Pennsylvania Association of Community Bankers, the Cross-State Credit Union Association, um, FDIC, which is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. We're also formal partners with the Center for Rural Pennsylvania, who do um, many studies about financial literacy in rural places in Pennsylvania and what the needs are for uh, our rural citizens in terms of, of literacy, financial literacy, and also IT and uh, technology support. Um, there, but there are also local groups that you can partner with to bring programming back into your libraries. Some of those local financial literacy partnerships would be things like local banks, local credit union, investment businesses that might be in your community. And lawyers are wonderful presenters on things like estate planning and how to uh, and and how to um, organize trusts and other uh, financial aspects that seniors might be interested in doing um, um, as they you know age um, and to make sure that they can uh, protect their assets for their uh, children and grandchildren. But th these are local entities that are available in, in any community and almost er any small community. How do you go about starting a partnership with one of your local areas? Well, first thing you wanna do is you need to reach out. So first, talk to your board, talk to your users, talk to your other staff members. Find out who in your community is viewed as a subject matter expert in financial dealings. And when they give you some names, you reach out, give them a call, send them an email, set up a time maybe to go out and have a cup of coffee, invite them to the library to sit down and, and you give them a quick tour and talk about what you have, what you have. But in your conversation, talk about what their goals are. What do they see as their particular outcomes? What do they want to see as an outcome in the community? If they match your library's goals, if you have common matching goals, then you've got a person who would make a good partnership. 
if their goals don't match what you want, as an example, let's say the entire goal of, of the lawyer is just to increase the number of wills that they submit. That might not be your goal. Uh, it doesn't match what you have in common. Um, then it's not a great partnership. Also, once if you do have common goals, ask them what they have done, what, what kind of trainings they might already have in the box, things that are available um, already so that you don't have to create something brand new all the time. Then see if they're willing to do a program with you. See if they're willing to schedule a time to come and talk about this, uh, talk about what, that, what subject they're doing. And then you just use the PA Forward Financial Literacy logo to, to advertise that program so that everyone knows that it is specifically a financial literacy program. Um, it's a real simple plan for setting up partnerships, but it is effective and it's effective for any sized library. So here's some, I hope I've given you a few things to think about as you return, uh, as you think about returning to have uh, financial literacy programming back in your libraries. Remember, we're, we can continue with virtual programs, we can move to in-person programs. I think the important thing is, is to note that um, we are, that it is always important for us to try to keep uh, moving Pennsylvania forward. Uh, I'm available anytime uh, for conversations uh, and also trying to make recommendations of some subject matter experts. Uh, some of the individuals you're going to uh, talk, uh, who's going to talk to you here in a moment, uh, are also uh, great resources, but I can be reached pretty simply at rob at palibraries.org. And at this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I am going to turn it over to Amy to talk about programs that FIA has available. All right, thank you so much. All right, so um, as Rob mentioned, my name is Amy Saudi. I am one of the higher education access partners at FIA. For those of you who do not know, FIA is the Pennsylvania Higher Education Assistance Agency. And so our mission is to provide affordable access to higher education. And we do that through our various grant programs, through our PA Forward Loan Program, and through the access partners, right? So the access partner, my role, um, is really to make sure that I'm providing resources and information to students and families across Pennsylvania so that they can make the best and most affordable choice when it comes to higher education. Now, there are access partners across the whole state of Pennsylvania, and we kind of are divided by the west and the east side of the state. We do have Will, William Lindsay, he is our manager, and Will is here with the conference with us. So feel free, you can stop in and say hi to Will, but he kind of manages all of the access partners across the state. And on the west side of the state, we have six access partners, including myself, um, and we all cover different territories and different counties. So I'm in Allegheny County, so that's my region. You know, I work with the schools, libraries, community organizations, et cetera, all throughout Allegheny County. My colleagues include Wendy Dunlap, Marion Hargrave, Amy Sloan, and Julie Fontana. And you can see on the screen what the different territories they all cover. They all have a lot more counties than I do. Um, and so some of them are more spread out throughout the state. We do have an access partner who covers Fayette, Green, Washington, and Westmoreland County. Uh, and that was Jan Har, who has retired with FIA. And so we are right now working on filling that position. So very shortly, in the next few weeks, we'll have that position filled and a new access partner um, in that territory. So if you're in one of those counties and you're not sure who to reach out to after the presentation, come talk to me. We can talk and I can share with you, um, you know, who the access partner is or who they will be if I know. Um, if anything, I can always provide you the link of information where that will be updated once we have that information. 
Now on the east side of the state, again, Will's our manager across the state, but we have seven access partners on the east side of the state. So we have Tiffany Devan, we have Robin Walker, we have Michael Burke, uh, Sonia Mann McFarlane, Diana, or Deanna Brown, excuse me, uh, Fran McEwen and Ron Felder. So I will share a link of where all of our contact information is. That's our phone numbers, our email addresses, and then all of the counties that we cover. So if you forget after the presentation who your access partner is, you'll have the link of where to go so you can know who to contact. But one resource that I wanna share with you that I think is really awesome that we do is with our online ordering. Um, and so we have brochures, posters, flyers, and more readily available that we update every year. Um, and these you can order online. So if you go to fia.org, you click on the tools uh, tab at the top and then select online ordering. You can actually go through all of the materials that we have, and it's a lot. So sometimes it can be a little bit overwhelming, but scroll through and you, know, you can look through to see what materials we have. And you can actually order those materials to be shipped to you for free. So you can select how many of each you want and then put in your um, address information and those materials will be shipped at no cost to you. Now the access partners as well, we can um, have that information shipped to you. In fact, you know, some of us, we go to our libraries, we check in, you know, we see if they have any questions for us. We typically try to provide the updated resources that we have. As I mentioned, you know, we update it every year just to make sure that that information is timely and relevant. Um, and so, you know, you might have already worked with your access partner before, but you can always reach out to them as well when it comes to ordering the materials. But some of the materials that we have, I just wanted to highlight some of the different um, things that you can be ordering and looking for. And so we do have a bunch of materials to help families with the FAFSA. The FAFSA is the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, and that's really the first step when it comes to applying for financial aid. Now, the application can be confusing and it can be daunting for families, so we do have a bunch of different materials that kind of help walk them through that process. So we have the FAFSA checklist, which talks about what information you want on hand when you complete the application. You know, how do you know what tax information to have, you know, what W-2 information you need to have and more. We also have our FAFSA tip sheet where we talk about some of the commonly asked questions that we get and how to know when you need to file the FAFSA, who files the FAFSA, et cetera. And then we also have a nice little one, uh, one pager about the FSA ID account information. So the FSA ID is actually your federal student aid account. And that is what you use in order to complete the FAFSA application. So you have to create an FSA ID and that's how you log in and you complete the FAFSA. We always get questions about that. Um, and you might get questions about that as well as families try to complete their FAFSA. So we have a nice one sheeter that talks about what the FSA ID account is, who needs to create one, which is both the student and a parent, um, and how they would go about completing those steps. We also have posters. So these are just some of our posters that we have, just two samples. Um, and so if you're looking for some posters to put up around the library or in your office, um, take a look at our online ordering site. You can order these as well to be shipped to you. And these are just good reminders for families about things like the FAFSA deadlines and when those need to be completed. Um, and, you know, the one on the left, you know, the more you learn, the more you earn. Um, and so we have just some couple different posters that you can order. Um, and, you know, again, we keep those updated yearly. And then we do have some additional materials. So some other things as well. So we have our Beyond High School booklet. This is really a very informative booklet that talks about things from career planning to life at college once you actually get to college and you're, you know, if you're living there or you're commuting. Um, we have our planning for higher education timeline. This is probably my favorite one um, because a lot of times when it comes to preparing for higher education, you don't know where to start and there's a lot of steps and you're not sure of the order that things should be completed. So this timeline really walks students through what should you be doing before your senior year? 
What should you be doing the fall of your senior year and then after senior year? Um, and so it's a really nice detailed list. Um, and so this can be something that is nice to have on hand. And again, you can order these online or at our online ordering site, if you click on the material, it will show you an electronic version as well. So if you have somewhere you wanna post these online, you can also post the electronic versions um, of these for your students and families to have. Now, with Thrufia, we have moved a lot of our events virtually, especially we offer some statewide webinars. Um, we do those throughout the fall, throughout the spring and into the summer. Um, and this is really geared towards anyone who wants to come and learn some more information about applying for financial aid or applying for scholarships. And so we post all of our statewide, all of our public webinars at thea.org slash virtual. So I urge you take a look at that website. It gets constantly updated as we're you know, creating new statewide webinars that we're hosting. Um, so you can view those scheduled webinars at that link. At the bottom of the page, we also have a link that says, you know, check out previously recorded webinars. If you click on that, it will show you past webinars that we have completed and that you'll be able to view the recorded link. So families could go back and watch webinars that we've already completed. And so we did a whole webinar series this summer. Um, and so you could always go on and take a look at some of those previously recorded webinars. We also have a YouTube page. So if you search at YouTube, you search for FIA Student Aid, that will take you to our YouTube page where we have really worked to create some short three to four minute videos, um, specifically diving in deep in some of the topics that we frequently get asked about. Um, so, you know, whose information needs to be reported on the FAFSA? We have a short information, informational video about that. Um, how do you know if you're a dependent or an independent student? And again, a video about that, um, how to pay for college. Again, videos on that and they're short clips um, that you can either you know, send students to or maybe post that link if you have somewhere that you want that link to be visible to your families. Um, again, we try to keep this information updated. I was actually one of the access partners who recently filmed the YouTube videos this summer. So what quite an experience it was but I think that this will really be beneficial for our students to just have short videos that they can view at their leisure to get some more information. So it's really important, you know, utilize us as your access partner in your county, utilize us for, you know, any type of information that you need. We host financial aid nights where we talk about the, fi the financial aid process, the FAFSA application, the FIA state grant application and more. We also host FAFSA workshops. So usually we work with our high schools to go into the school in a computer lab and we sit down and we help families one-on-one -on -one complete that FAFSA application. We're always looking you know, to host more FAFSA workshops, but oftentimes we need a location to do that. Um, and we like to have it in a computer lab. So if you have something like that at your library, you can work with your access partner and you can team up partner to offer either a financial aid night or a FAFSA workshop, either virtually or in person. Um, so, you know, we're able to do both now, um, which is just a great resource for our families um, to be able to have virtual events and in-person events. Um, the link at the bottom of the screen is actually where you can go to view information to figure out who your access partner is. So you can click on that link in the PowerPoint and that'll take you right to the access partner information page. Also too, I really urge you to reach out to your access partner and help to keep us updated. So we do send out monthly newsletters, so monthly emails where we you know, share some important updates, things in the industry that are happening, things that we've heard through our uh, community partners um, or our schools that are happening. Um, and so we work really hard to get those newsletters out every month. And we can only send that to you if we know that you want to receive that information. So reach out to your access partner, make sure that we get your information and then keep it updated. If there's any changes at your library, let us know so we can update our system and make sure that everyone who's getting information should be getting information. Or if they're not getting information, make sure that they start to get the information. Um, 
we send out as well when we do have statewide and public webinars, we send those out either in newsletters or in some special email updates, as long with any important notifications about maybe our grant programs or our, our loan program. So it's good just to make sure you're in contact with your access partner so we can get you all of that information. We have been working really hard this past summer to get our website updated. Um, we want it to look nicer. We want it to be more easy, more easy, um, user friendly, right? So we've been working really hard to get the website updated. And so I, you know, urge you to take a look at our website. You go to fia.org, um, and you know we've tried to make the information sort it so that you're not just looking through a huge long list of resources but it's easier to find what you're looking for. Also, you can follow us on social media. Again, we post information about our webinars. We post um, fun facts about things with financial aid and some of our grant programs and where to find more information. So, you know, I urge you, you know, follow us on social media, um, especially if you're partnering with your access partner, you know, you can share that information on social media and our team will try to reshare that, uh, retweet it or uh, share it on Facebook to get some more um, people seeing that post as well. And then as I mentioned, uh, my name is Amy Saudi. Again, I'm the Higher Education Access Partner in Allegheny County, but I'm here at the conference. Um, so if you have questions, feel free to jump into my booth. I'm happy to help answer any questions you have, or you can email me at amy.saudi at fia.org or you can call or text me at my number on the screen. I just wanna thank you all again. Um, I hope this was helpful. Um, please feel free to reach out though if you have any questions or concerns. All right, I guess that's my cue here. I'm gonna load up the presentation. Okay. Um, well, hello everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, my name is Anda Checo, and I'm Director of Program Development for Consumer Programs at the Pennsylvania Treasury Department. It's an honor to speak with you today alongside Amy about how Treasury's Keystone Scholars Program can fit into what libraries are already doing to promote, to promote financial literacy in Pennsylvania. So today I plan to give a brief overview of child development accounts and what the research says about the outcomes for children and their families. Then I'll share details about our Keystone Scholars Child Development Account Program, including how it works, and an exciting new $50 bonus for WIC participants. Then I'll talk about how we'd like to partner with you to get the word out and help families access their accounts. So child development accounts, or CDAs, are long-term savings accounts that offer families program contributions, like initial deposits or matches, to save for their children's post-secondary education. They're also sometimes referred to as children's savings accounts, or CSAs. But at Treasury, we use the term child development accounts because, as you'll see, they're so much more than just a savings account. So by providing assets to all children very early in life, CDAs provide a fair start for all children to build assets for college that will grow over time. But CDAs also provide kids with additional benefits like the knowledge that their community believes in them and has set aside funds for them, um, which helps create a future focused identity and hope for the future. So by knowing that the account is there and engaging with it or talking about it at home, CDAs influence parental attitudes, their behaviors and expectations for their children's future and their parental involvement. This, uh, this leads to improved social and emotional development as well as academic performance, which in turn lead to better opportunities in the future for kids. The child starts to develop what researchers call a college-bound identity. And when I use that term college here, it's meant as a catch-all for all kinds of post-secondary education and training. So research tells us that parents have high expectations for their children um, to go on to post-secondary education or training when they're young. But as we all know, there are roadblocks along the way. So you at your libraries can play an important role in helping to maintain families' expectations for their child's future and bolster children's college-bound identities as they grow by ensuring that families know about their Keystone Scholars account. So now I'll tell you a little bit more about the evidence behind CDAs. 
In 2007, researchers at Washington University in St. Louis began the first and longest running randomized control trial of a CDA policy to date, which is called CEDOK. Results from CEDOK show that, the, that CDAs have positive benefits for children and their families, often regardless of whether the family is saving on their own or not. These benefits are usually even greater for the most financially vulnerable families. So this image shows various benefits that were found when participants were at age four. It shows that engagement with a CDA leads to more positive parenting scores, higher educational expectations among parents, fewer uh, maternal depression symptoms, better social emotional development of children, and of course, more savings for future education. The research also shows that CDA programs can have more significant effects when they're offered together with social services. Um, just to make sure, oh, there we go, sorry. So Pennsylvania Treasury has been motivated from the beginning to create and run its child development account program, Keystone Scholars, because of the strong research evidence in support of CDA benefits. Through the Keystone Scholars program, we have three key goals. The first is to help parents maintain high expectations for their child's future education. I'll tell you in a minute about the Keystone Scholar survey results that show that nearly all parents of newborns who responded expect their children to go on to higher education. Keystone Scholars establishes that expectation early and is there to remind families of that goal as the child grows. The second is to cultivate a college-bound identity in children. A well-known study by Dr. Willie Elliott at the University of Michigan showed that children with a savings account, even with less than $500 in it, are three times more likely to pursue a two or four year degree and four times more likely to graduate. This is due to more than just having assets in the account, but in their thinking about the future. We wanna help activate the child's own identity as someone who will go on to post-secondary education. And third is to prompt parents to start saving as early as possible in order to give funds the longest time horizon to grow and also again to activate the college going expectations early. We ultimately want to see all Pennsylvanian students, especially those from disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds, successfully complete the post secondary education of their choice without an unreasonable debt burden. This will lead to improved financial security for individuals through their gainful employment and ensure that the Commonwealth has a skilled workforce for years to come. So we're very proud that Pennsylvania has the first and largest universal automatic child development account program beginning at birth in the country. And it has, it's, it's the uh, first that has legislation behind it. The program was piloted in 2018 in six counties and then it went statewide on January 1st, 2019. The funds can be used for higher education expenses when the child turns 18 until age 29. And the program is funded by surplus earnings on our PA529 guaranteed savings plan um, that are held in an omnibus account. So it uses no taxpayer money. We encourage families to open their own PA529 account to add on their own savings as well. Eventually, the child will need a PA529 account for Treasury to distribute the funds, so it's best to just open it early um, and get saving while the child's young. So at Treasury, we receive a file from the Department of Health each month with data on all the births in the state, which is what allows us to establish and fund the new accounts in each child's name. There's about a three month lag between when a baby's born and when we receive the birth file, which is why new parents receive a letter from us about four to five months after birth, encouraging them to log in or register for their account. So just a quick word on the savings vehicle. Pennsylvania Treasury manages the PA 529 College and Career Savings Program. We have two 529 plans. I mentioned before that the Keystone Scholars funds are invested in the Guaranteed Savings Plan, which is like a prepaid plan where the investment return is based on tuition inflation. We also have the investment plan, which offers various Vanguard funds. We encourage families, again, to open their own PA529 account and link it to their Keystone Scholars account to see all their funds in one place. And these funds can be used for a variety of uh, post-secondary education expenses, including trade school or vocational school, community college, and even apprenticeships. So it's not just four-year college. Contributions are deductible from state taxes and funds grow tax-free and are withdrawn tax-free if they're used for qualified expenses, 
which makes a big difference after 18 years. As a government entity, we're well positioned to make our savings programs more accessible to all families, meaning we have low fees and low minimums uh, to open and to contribute. So we now have nearly 306,000 accounts created and funded. Pennsylvania alone accounted for more than half of the increase in the number of CDA accounts in the country the year it went statewide. So that gives you an idea of the scale that a universal program like, uh, like ours from, from such a large state provides. One key metric that we monitor closely is the percentage of families that go online and register their account. Overall, it's about 10% or at this point, 31,000 families to date. This registration rate tells us that the family is aware of the account. And it also gives us a crucial piece of information that we don't already get through the health file, which is the parent's email address. So we can keep in touch with families and encourage their savings journey as the child grows. The good news is that we're seeing over time with each year of births, the registration rate is going up. So if you just look at the 2021 babies, the registration rate is about 4%. While for 2020 babies, it's about nine or nine and a half. And for 2019, it's closer to 13%. So that's encouraging to see. As you can see, we also monitor the percent of those families that go on to open their own PA 529 and link it to their Keystone Scholars account, which is currently about 20% of those who've registered. So again, we want to make sure all families of children born in 2019 or after are aware of their Keystone Scholars account, because if they don't know about it, it won't do them any good. Um, that's where organizations like libraries become such great partners to help spread the word and integrate our information with your programming. Um, I just want to tell you about uh, an exciting new development this year. Um, child development account best practices call for additional targeted deposits for low income families. Uh, this year, we've been able to provide an additional $50 deposit into the Keystone Scholars accounts of all Pennsylvania children born January 1st through June 30th of this year to mothers enrolled in the Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, also known as WIC. The $50 is in addition to the universal $100 Keystone Scholars starter deposit. It's funded by uh, philanthropic funds, so again, no taxpayer money is used. And though it's a modest amount, um, it represents an important step in building onto the Keystone Scholars program in a way that addresses existing inequities and promotes wealth building among some of our state's most disadvantaged families. So even though the window for eligible births has now closed, it's even more important than ever to get the word out about this additional benefit because more and more of these babies' accounts are now being funded each month and families are now able to log in and view them. So we really need all the help we can get in spreading the word on the Bright Future Booster, um, especially because since it's grant funded right now, we need to show strong results, um, including registration rate, to make the case to gain sustainable funding for it in the future so more children can benefit. Uh, now I want to tell you a bit about some of the amazing findings that came out of a baseline survey of about 6,000 Keystone Scholars families in a control group that we did. The survey launched at the rollout of the statewide program and asked questions about parents' expectations for their children's post-secondary education, as well as savings behavior and financial literacy. Uh, we're going to do a follow-up survey in 2023 in order to gauge uh, any change in respondent views. In our recently released report on the survey, um, we share that 98%, so nearly all of parents surveyed, believe that their child will go on to get a bachelor's degree. And that is just incredible. Um, and this was true across income, parental education, geography, race, and ethnicity. And in particular, more than 90% of parents from each race and ethnicity expected their child to earn at least a bachelor's degree. But the survey also found that the uh, parental belief that it's too early to save was most consistently associated with lower parental expectations for a child's future among all the different factors that were examined. Um, and having low income was one of the strongest predictors of reporting that it's too early to save. Um, the silver lining though is that this too early to save mindset is something that can be changed. Um, rather than a matter of circumstances or assets in the bank, it's a mindset. Um, and so it lends itself to change more than any of the other indicators we looked at. So through the Keystone Scholars program, that's exactly what we're setting out to do. We seek to raise the awareness of families that this account is there and that it's never too early to start saving even just a little bit. 
And this is why your partnership is so important to us. So one of the things that it's um, great for you to be able to do is include our materials for parents in the young children sections of your libraries um, so that you can help raise awareness among fa more families about Keystone Scholars and the importance of starting the education savings journey early in life. Um, like FIA, we have a, a wide array of materials to help partners like you disseminate information on Keystone Scholars. Um, many of our materials are uh, available both in English and Spanish. We have social media content, videos, um, just to name a few. Um, and you can go uh, to this uh, link right here and you can also order materials online that we'll print and send to you. Um, or you can download digital uh, materials as well for, for use online. Um, so this is just some of what we have in our existing catalog, but if you have an idea for something that would work particularly well with a program you're running, um, we'd love to hear about that as well and work with you to develop something new if that's what's needed. Um, the Keystone Scholars program is successful mainly due to the partnerships we've built. We really pride our, ourselves on working with incredible groups and organizations that have helped roll it out since, uh, since it launched. Um, and, and have done that seamlessly. And libraries are a really special partner on that list. So we know that libraries are key community hubs. You're a trusted source of information for parents and you're where so many children develop a lifelong love of reading and learning. So your library is particularly positioned, uh, well positioned and can help more families um, first and foremost by just informing parents about the program and making our materials available to them and reassuring them that the hundred dollars is real because a lot of people get our letter and think oh this is too good to be true so that's where um, a trusted source like a library you know just reassuring that it's real is very helpful um, you can also invite treasury staff to join a library event or conduct a separate webinar on keystone scholars pa529 and how to save for education um, we can speak to all ages audiences along with fia and other organizations um, and then please also keep us in mind, especially for events with families that have young children. Um, and then finally, in addition to these efforts, um, what we would really love is if you're able to help families log into their accounts. Um, if a family uh, has their letter from Treasury and they bring it to the library and are using the computer, um, this is a great way to help families actually uh, get registered and I'll show you how to do that now. So families should watch the mail for a letter from Treasury um, that's sent about four to six months after the child's born. Um, then they can access their account online uh, when they get this letter and it'll have instructions on how to log in. So at that point when they get the letter it means that the account has been created and funded. Families can log on uh, to the Keystone Scholars homepage you see here and it should only take a few minutes. The user will first be prompted to enter the child's date of birth and if the baby is younger than six months and the family hasn't received their letter yet, they can still pre-register the child on the same website. So uh, to register online, the parents just need to put in these four pieces of information. And um, then by logging in, they can track the growth of their $100 over time and they can link it to a PA529 account where they can see all of their education savings in one place. Um, again, while a PA529 account is not required, init initially at least, uh, the child must be a beneficiary of a PA529 account later on when they go to use the funds. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, Keystone Scholars. Um, we're so thrilled to be working with the Pennsylvania Library Association on its wonderful PA Forward initiative and with the amazing libraries throughout our Commonwealth. So I hope I have piqued your interest in the Keystone Scholars program and outlined some of the ways that you could partner with us. Um, please reach out and let us know how we can support your financial literacy programming. Thanks so much. All right, um, Amy, Anne, thank you. Uh, I want to thank all of you again for attending our program welcoming financial literacy programming back to your libraries. Together we can achieve success. I want to especially thank Amy and Anne for the time today and for your presentation. Please check out the exhibit hall. 
FIA and the Department of Treasury are exhibiting with PALA here at the conference. Uh, they'll be available to talk about programming, resources, materials, and concerns. Please take a few minutes to visit their booths and thank them for their partnership with PA Forward. I hope you have a great rest of your day and the rest of your virtual conference. And remember that literacy is power and libraries provide the fuel for you, your community, for Pennsylvania.